In this video, I'm going to discuss the theory behind the melting point. And so the melting point is something that we can use in chemistry to help identify a substance and help identify whether it is pure. So hopefully you remember from general chemistry our heating curve here where we have heat added on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis here and so at solid and so this is for water here so at solid we are putting heat in and the temperature is steadily going up and the slope of that curve is going to depend on the amount of our substance here and on the specific heat for it where for water the specific heat of solid water ice is 2.05 joules over grams degree Celsius then when we get to zero degrees Celsius we end up at the heat of fusion here so as we add heat the temperature will not be going up so this is heat that is required to break the intermolecular forces between the molecules and allow them to start sliding past each other when they become a liquid then liquid water here has a specific heat of 4.18 joules over grams degree Celsius. So while it's liquid, we add heat and the temperature will steadily rise with the slope here now determined by this specific heat for liquid water. Then when we get up here to the heat of vaporization, so for water that's 100 degrees Celsius, that's the boiling point, we then have to add more heat into here while it's not going up in temperature so that we can again break the intermolecular forces between the water molecules and turn it into vapor. And then when it becomes a, a vapor, when it's in the gas phase, we can once again add more heat and see that the temperature keeps rising. So in this video, what we're going to be interested in is this part right here, where we are melting our substances. And for organic chemistry, we're going to be interested in more substances than just water, but water is always kind of a nice one to use as an example for this. And so when we are looking for the melting point, we're actually looking for the range of melting point. And so the range is between the first drop of liquid forms and when the entire solid has turned to liquid. So for example, you might have a sample that the first drop appears at 51 degrees Celsius and the entire sample is liquefied at 53 degrees Celsius. And so that would tell you that the melting point range is 51 degrees to 53 degrees Celsius. And so the melting point indicates the purity of a substance in two ways. So the purer the material, the higher its melting point, and the purer the material, the narrower its melting point range. And so we can look at a phase diagram that looks like this, where on the left side here, we have our pure substance A, and over here, we have our pure substance B. And so we see the melting point of A when it's pure, the range is very narrow here, and the melting point is very exact. Whereas when we start adding some impurity in the form of B, then we get this split here, where this point right here, would be the temperature at which the first drop forms. And then this up here would be the temperature at which the entire sample is liquid. And so I guess I should have labeled on the sides here. These are temperature right here. And so this would be the temperature here at which the first drop forms and this right here where the entire sample becomes a liquid. And so that's what I have shown over here as well for B. Then we also have this eutectic point here where we get to the lowest melting point and we have a small range. And so this is how you can tell the purity of a substance. So as I'll discuss later, say we have something that we think is pure A, what we can do is we can melt something that we do know is pure A, so something maybe you just bought from like Sigma Aldrich or something, and then compare the melting point of that to your unknown sample. And if they are the same, then you would know that your sample is pure. If the pure one is at the right melting point, but then yours is maybe down here, it has this range and it's lower, 
then that would tell you that you, what your sample that you think is pure is actually not pure. All right, so we can look at the freezing or melting point depression. So that's what we're looking up at over here. So if we have pure A, our melting point is up right here. Then the depression is the fact that the temperature at which it melts or freezes, those are reverse processes, goes down. And so we can use this formula right here, which you might recognize from general chemistry. So this delta T here is the change in the freezing point. This Kf here is called the cryoscopic constant, and that has units of degrees Celsius over molality, where, remember, molality is the moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And this B here is the molality of our solution, the solution that we want to see what the new freezing point is. And then this I right here is called the Van Hoff factor, and that is unitless. And so our cryoscopic constant we can calculate using this right here, where the R is the ideal gas constant, the M is the molar mass of the solvent, the TF here is the freezing point of the pure solvent, then this delta H of fusion here is the molar enthalpy of fusion of the solvent. And when you put all these in for water, for instance, you get this. So it's 1.853. This is Kelvin times kilogram over moles. So then this Van Hoff factor here is just a measure of how many ions we end up with in solution. So it's the degree of dissociation here, this alpha is the fraction of the original solute molecules that have dissociated. So that's going to be dependent on the solubility of our, of our salt here. If a fraction alpha of the solute dissociates into N ions, then we use I equals one plus alpha N minus one. So for instance, the dissociation of KCl of potassium chloride, we get two ions here. So N equals two, and so I equals one plus alpha two minus one, so it's just one plus alpha. If we do the dissociation of this tripotassium phosphate here, we end up with three plus one ions here. So N equals four, and so I equals one plus alpha times four minus one, so it's one plus three alpha. For strong electrolytes, we assume that these completely dissociate, so we can call alpha approximately equal to one. And so up here, the I for our K3PO4 would be four, because we'd have one plus three times one. These can actually be smaller than one, and one way that can happen, and this is for acetic acid, which has an alpha of about 0.5, the molecules actually dimerize with each other, and so that actually reduces the amount of effective amount of the acetic acid in solution. So we can look at an example here. So what is the freezing point depression for 0.3 molal of K3PO4? So remember, this splits into four different ions here, and we have this for our water. This is our KF here for our water. We put the molality in here, and then the Van Hoff factor there, and what we see is that we get 2.22 degrees Celsius, which means that the freezing point will be 2.22 degrees Celsius lower. And so if you live in a colder cl climate like I do in Michigan, you know that we often salt the roads in the winter to try to melt the ice. And this is the reason why we do that, because when we put salt on it, it reduces the freezing point of water. And so the ice will become liquid at a lower temperature. And so that's kind of the way that this is used in practical purposes, if you live in a colder climate like I do. So let's think about the lowering of the melting point A by adding impurity B. So remember, we're looking at something like this. Say we have something that's 100% A, but then we add some impurity B so that we end up maybe with a melting point that is right here. So at that point, because we've added some B impurity to it. And so we want to know why exactly this is causing this 
this melting point depression here. So substance A has a lower melting point and so will begin to melt first. So that's what we see here where the melting point of A is lower than the melting point of B. Substance A has the lower melting point, so as A begins to melt, B begins to dissolve in the liquid A. So A is turning to liquid, B is still a solid, but now it's dissolving in the A. And so B dissolving in A lowers the melting point of A, as we saw up here, that we get this melting point or freezing point depression. Those are saying kind of the same thing. So the more impurity B that is added, the lower the melting point of A becomes. Because if we look over here, if we add only this much B, then we can dissolve all of the B in our A. So we get over here, and then we, are, we have dissolved all the B in it. The eutectic point here is when the A will become saturated with the B. And then you end up with solid B that can't go away, and so you have to start melting that solid B. So the more impurity B is added, the lower the melting point of A becomes because you are dissolving more of that B into the A. But you cannot dissolve an infinite amount of B in the A. At some point, A becomes saturated with B, and no more is dissolved. At this point, to melt the entire sample, you must also melt the undissolved B. So when A is saturated with B, this is the eutectic point which, as I said, is this right here. And so we can look at this melting phase diagram that looks like this. And so what we have here, so if we're melting A, so if we have, say, mostly A, but we have some impurity of B, so maybe we are at this point right here. So what we end up with is a liquid solution with B dissolved in A, then there's going to be some solid A and B. So, you know, when you're right here, when you haven't completely melted, but you have started melting, there's still going to be some solid A. But the liquid A is going to have B dissolved in it. Whereas if we go over here instead, say we have B with some A impurity, we're going to end up with a liquid solution with some solid B in it, and it's going to be B dissolved in A plus B. So that's how you can read one of these melting phase diagrams. Of course, you can have more than two substances, and if you have three, you can use what's called a ternary phase diagram, where it looks like a triangle like this. And so the way we can read this is when we are up here at this top corner, this is 100%, 100% A. Down here is 100% B. And over here is 100% C. And so if we go over here to where the green line joins this line here, that means we have 0% C. So we, our C is decreasing as we follow this line. And we have 50% B and 50% A because we're halfway between our A and our B. And then we can do the same thing for all the other ones. Over here we have 0% B and then 50% of A and C. Here we have 0% A, 50% of B and C. And so this point here where they all meet, that would be 33.333 repeating percent of all three of our substances. And so if we want to find some point here that's not right in the center, what we do is we take the measurement, the length of each of the lines here, and so then we want to divide the A1 here, for instance, by A1 plus A2. So we divide the length of this line by the length of this line plus this line and multiply by 100 to get the percent there. And we do the same thing for all three of the, or all two of the other ones, and those should add up to 100%. And that tells us if we have a substance that lies at this point in our ternary diagram, that that would mean that it's 54% A, 18% B, and 28% C. Then we can apply this to the melting point. So if we have that same point here, we can think of this as similar to a topographical map where each of these lines here are equal melting point temperatures. So any amount of 
this substance where it has that same amount of A, B, and C that lies along this line is going to have a melting point of 40 degrees. And so we can think of this as a topographical map, as I said. And then these purple lines here are our co-tectics, as, as we can see labeled over here, where, where, the, where these end up on these lines here are our binary eutectics. Then this one here in the middle is called our ternary eutectic. And I liked this image here because it showed this oblique view where you can see in 3D how those things are sloping in three-dimensional space. So just like I said, like a topographical map. So this was for a geology, this is on a geology website, so it's looking at magma. So that's why these melting points on here are so large. But I liked that diagram to show what this is uh, kind of trying to display here. All right, so the melting point, the utility of it, the reason that we care about it for like an organic chemistry class, for instance, is, as I said, you can test the purity of the substance. So if you have a substance and you do not know if it is pure, and if you mix the pure sample of the substance, you think it is, you can do a mixture melting point. So add the pure mixture and your substance in equal amounts, and if the, this causes the melting point to drop, then your sample is impure. If the melting point remains the same, then your sample is pure. Melting point can be used when attempting to determine the identity of a substance. So after you purify it, you get the melting point, and then you can compare it to some known melting point. So this is just an example of a table that has known melting points. And so you can compare your sample after a purification to known melting points to try and narrow down what it is. So melting points are not always going to be definitive because different substances can have the same melting point, but it is something that can help in the identification, especially if you're doing a reaction and you know what the melting point of your product should be. You do the reaction, the purification, you get the melting point of the product, and it just happens to coincide with the known melting point of that product, then that's usually a good indication that you have what you think you have. Whereas just in general, getting the melting point isn't something that you can just definitively say, well, it has this melting point, so it has to be this thing. But like I said, in an experiment where you know what you're trying to get, then it's a pretty good indicator of what you got and the purity of what you got. All right, so now for a little melting point theory here. And so this is going to go beyond what you would probably ever do in a sophomore level organic chemistry class, but I think it's illustrative of some of the things that are actually involved in the melting point and why different things have different melting points. So the question here with our theory is can we can we predict the melting point of something? So say you were just given the structure of a chemical, would you be able to actually put something into a formula and come up with what the melting point should be? And so that's what I'm going to look at sort of two theories here of trying to predict the melting point. And so that's going to show us some of the things that are important in what determines what the melting point is. So the first one is the Lindemann criterion. So the Lindemann criterion states that during the melting of a solid, the average amplitude of the thermal vibrations increases with increases in temperature and melting occurs if the amplitude of vibration becomes large enough for displacements of atoms compared to their equilibrium lattice sites which are in the range of one half of the interatomic distance. So later, Lindemann parameter was modified by Gilvari by considering the root mean square amplitude of the thermal vibration. So according to Gilvari, the melting process is initiated when the fraction of root mean square amplitudes and in interatomic distances reaches a critical value. So what this is essentially saying is we have a crystal lattice that looks like this, and we could think of this as uh, as extending off 
in all directions here. But if we're looking at just a section of it, we have these these molecules or atoms or whatever in our crystal lattice that have a mass of capital M, and these are vibrating within the lattice. And so that's what those red arrows are showing, is that these are vibrating. And these are spaced some distance A apart from each other. And so we can think of the vibrations as an amplitude here. So this is going to be a sinusoidal wave here in time. So this would be time in this direction. So those are vibrating. And so we want to find the critical value, which is called the Lindemann parameter. And that's basically 0.1, so it's usually considered 0.1, but it can vary between 0.05 and 0.2. And so that's just telling you essentially how much these things are vibrating. So I put this here on the graph, this eta, this Greek letter eta here. And so if the vibrations, the amplitude of the vibrations goes beyond that eta, then the vibrations are too large and your crystal lattice will start breaking down and you get melting. And so that's why we have here, this is the mean square amplitude of the vibrations. This is the distance between molecules or atoms in our crystal lattice. And this is that threshold fraction right here. And so if this number right here becomes larger than some specific threshold, then you are going to get melting. And we can calculate this also using this formula right here, where we have our Boltzmann constant, the temperature T right here. This is the mass of the atom. And then this nu here, this Greek letter nu here is the vibration frequency. So the Debye frequency, which is nu sub d, is defined as the highest allowed mode of vibration with all oscillators vibrating at the same frequency and phase in the crystal. So the oscillators here being our molecules or atoms here in the crystal structure. It is reasonable to assume that in the melting point of a solid, the ions or atoms have not only the highest allowed amplitude as dictated by the Lindemann criterion, but also the highest allowed frequency. And so they are just defining that highest allowed frequency as the Debye frequency, which they are calling this new sub D. And so we introduce the Debye temperature here, which is this theta sub D, which they are calculating like this, where we have H, the Planck constant, our Debye frequency, and the Boltzmann constant right here. And so we can put that then into our formula right here. And this shows that the average vibration amplitude of the atoms or ions in the crystal increases linearly with the temperature. However, this cannot increase indefinitely. And Lindemann criterion offers the upper limit at the melting point when the square root of the average square vibration amplitude exceeds a certain fraction of the interatomic distance. And so we introduce this here. So from above where we have our Greek letter eta times a uh, that's at the melting point when the general relation describing the melting temperature is this. And so this formula right here is supposed to be trying to predict the melting temperature right here. So you'd want to plug in your theta right here and your eta and your a. So the a is the distance between atoms and the crystal. This is our threshold value. And then this right here, this theta was our Debye temperature. So when we express the mass of the atom M here in terms of the atomic mass number A, we, uh, with Na, the Avogadro constant, we obtain this. So this is our relationship here between the melting temperature and the Debye temperature. So this is supposed to be the formula that you can plug in all your values into and that is supposed to give you your melting temperature. And so this is, as I said, just a theory of how melting actually occurs. The take home message is essentially these things in our crystal lattice and our solid start vibrating so much that they reach a critical threshold and then they will start breaking off from each other. So you can think of these 
vibrating so much that they just sort of start breaking away from each other, and that's what causes the melting. So then there is Car Carnelli's rule. So Carnelli's rule states of two or more isometric compounds, so isometric meaning that they have the same number of each atom in it. So, for instance, you can have something that has like C6H14, and this can have different isomers of it. So you could have the N-alkane, or you could have things with branches coming off of it. And so they're saying that of two or more of those isometric compounds, those whose atoms are more symmetrically and more compactly arranged melt higher than those in which the atomic arrangement is asymmetrical or in the form of long chains. So we want to, if we increase the rotational symmetry of the molecule, then the probability of it being in the proper orientation for incorporation into a crystal is increased. So this is consistent with Pauling's contention that melting is related to intermolecular attraction, whereas recrystallization is related to both intermolecular attraction and orientation. And so essentially what that means is, so we say we have a molecule that has a three-fold rotational symmetry, so our sigma here is three, then there are only three possible ways to actually fit something onto this right here. But if we have something that has a six-fold symmetry, then there are six possible ways to start putting things onto the surfaces onto this molecule right here. So there are more faces with which to incorporate it into a crystal lattice. And then if you get something that is perfectly spherical, now you can start making these, these theta, these angles at which they are sort of uh, coming together arbitrarily small. And so there are an effectively an infinite number of faces with which to interact with other molecules. And so our, our rotational symmetry is infinite. Then this epsilon here is equal to 1, where the epsilon is the so-called eccentricity of the molecule, and is essentially a measure of how spherical the molecule is. So something that's perfectly spherical has an epsilon equal to 1, and if it is not perfectly spherical, then it is greater than 1. Where we see that the triangle is greater than 1, the hexagon is greater than 1, but less than the triangle. And those are two of the parameters that are put into this theory here, where we see that this sigma here is our rotational symmetry, and then this epsilon is that, that eccentricity factor. And then we also have this uppercase phi right here, which is the molecular flexibility number and is given by this n minus 1 here, where this n is the number of non-ring methylene groups. And so what that means is, so if you have a molecule that looks like this, this has one, two, three, four non-ring methylene groups. And so it's essentially, well, yeah, they call it the flexibility number because these are going to be flexible. Whereas if you instead had this in a ring like this, these are no longer flexible. So we still have four of these methylene groups, but they are no longer flexible because they are in this ring structure. So you can't rotate around those bonds. And so this is the flexibility number. And so again, this is trying to, this is trying to calculate the melting temperature of a substance. Uh, this thing here in the numerator, so this NIMI is the pairwise interactions that are a result of Van der Waals and hydrogen bonding forces, where the N here is the number of groups in the molecule, and the M is the value of a group that reflects its ability to interact with groups on neighboring molecules. So hydrocarbons, for instance, interact weakly, and so they have a low M where polar groups interact more strongly, and so have a larger M. And so, again, this is trying to calculate what the melting point of a molecule is. So the idea is that if you are given 
a structure of a molecule. You could input all of these different parameters into this and try to calculate the melting temperature. But again, you're not going to probably use this in any sophomore organic chemistry class. What I want to, the main thing to show here is just that these are the things that are important for the melting point. So things like the symmetry of the molecule, things like its flexibility, things like how spherical it is. And so that's what this, this theory of melting point is telling us. Where up here, this theory of melting point is telling us that it's about the vibrations of these, these constituents of our solid. So whether those are atoms or molecules or ions. And I believe the paper where I got this from, which is this Vopsen et al., says that when you start getting things that are larger than single atoms, that this theory actually starts kind of falling apart. Uh, when you start getting larger s systems as each sort of monomer in your crystal, that this theory is best when it's just atoms in your crystal. And I think it also starts falling apart if your crystal, if the atoms in, in your crystal start becoming too different in size. So for instance, if you have something where it's two different ions, where one is small and one is big, and it's repeating patterns of this, that this theory also starts falling apart, but, or it starts being less accurate. I don't want to say that it's, you know, just completely wrong, but it starts being less accurate. But like I said, this is just an exercise to talk about things that are important to consider when we are thinking about the melting point of something. But anyway, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.